Super excited to be joined today on The Peaks Life by Kirsten Murphy. Kirsten's a longtime friend, a longevity biohacker and keto coach. She grew up in Perth, Australia and studied sports science in the early 90s when carb loading for physical performance and low fat everything was all the rage. Now, like many of us, Kirsten had all of her nutritional beliefs completely turned on their head in 2009 when she started training at a local CrossFit gym where she learned about the paleo diet. Kirsten's own personal transformation inspired her and her husband Match to set up one of Australia's very first CrossFit gyms, Kui CrossFit. That was in Perth in 2010. Now, in 2016, Kirsten had a health scare. She was diagnosed with a rare form of skin cancer and underwent surgery to remove part of her ear. Now, today we're going to talk to Kirsten about uh, what happened at the time, the impact it had on her, the surgery, and how she handled things after that. But very, very exciting to us is how she used a therapeutic version of the keto diet and a major shift in lifestyle, work and home to basically set her on a path to outstanding health, which is what she enjoys today. Now, Kirsten now lives in Bali and she travels the world helping others to optimize their health through the keto lifestyle. So I'm really excited to have Kirsten on the, on the podcast because Kirsten's got a really interesting background, really interesting history when it comes to everything keto, everything wellness, fitness, movement, and we could probably spend a couple of hours, but for the sake of our listeners, <laughs> <laughs> we, we'll, won't. we we'll, promise. we'll keep it down. Yeah. Um, but Kirsten, I think, you know, to start off with, we'd love to hear a bit about your story, um, you know, get to, get to know you a bit. Yeah, sure. Well, I'll try and keep it brief because uh, <laughs> there, it goes it goes on many many different turns. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but look, let me start by fessing up that I'm a '70s baby, and uh, I studied um, sports science back in the early '90s. Now, back then, as we know, it was carb loving and low fat everything. Um, I'm actually going to blame that whole era for my poor performance in swimming and, and triathlons, which was my sport <laughs> at that time, because carb loading the night before never really worked for me. But um, so, you know, that, that's kind of my background. And for years and years and years, I really thought that that was the best way to, to fuel our bodies. I worked in um, corporate health for a few years and then ended up going back to university, studying marketing and did the whole corporate global marketing career for 15 years and, and was very fortunate to travel a lot with that role. And, um, but then my, my hubby and I ended up in Aspen, Colorado in um, 2006. And a few years after living there, we were introduced to the wonders of CrossFit. Now, I know you two are massive advocates of CrossFit as well. And, uh, and so that truly changed my whole belief to training and nutrition. Like it really was a major flip for me. And I was like, this is the thing that I wish I'd known about many, many years before. So it also had a huge shift in my body composition. So I lost um, 15 pounds, which is, uh, gee, what's that? Like seven and a half kilos? Seven, 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 seven and kilos. Half kilos. Um, you know, and I'm only five foot one. Lynn and I are in the little pocket <laughs> rocket brigade. So that made a massive difference to me. And I, I was really carrying it all around my mid torso. I never seemed to put weight on on my legs and, and upper body or arms, but just that really unhealthy mid-torso way. Uh, and that was just really, thankfully, to my CrossFit coach at that time who introduced me to the CrossFit way of eating, which is very simply that kind of paleo style of um, eat meats, vegetables, some fruit, little starch, no sugars, and consume food to, um, you know, to fuel your energy needs, not body fat had a huge shift. Um, and back then I followed very strictly what was known as the zone diet. Okay, so that kind of um, led my whole, and I see you guys nodding because I think we've all <laughs> been through this journey too. Um, and it was fantastic for me being able to dial in my macronutrients. 
So anyway, so, I, I, I yeah, so, do you want to jump in there? Um, yeah. Jump in. So for, for our listeners um, or watchers who don't know what the zone diet is, just give us a mm. second on, on the zone diet. Yeah, so the zone is where you're following a macro-based diet and you're counting up your proteins, your carbohydrates and your fats. Um, so it's a very simple way of condensing the diet or those um, foods into blocks. So me as a female um, that's five foot one, I eat a certain number of blocks per day. Mike being a taller, larger guy is going to eat more blocks than me. It's a very easy way of being able to get your head around macronutrients. Yeah. Cool. Um, and it also follows along that principle of eating clean food, you know, that kind of uh, blends in with paleo because like any, you know, same now, I guess, as keto or, pay, um, or the zone, you can do dirty keto or dirty zone and just get the right macronutrients, but you're not getting all the other health benefits. Right. Um, so yeah, that's I can talk all day about that bit. <laughs> but um, so anyway, lo and behold, it completely changed both my and my husband Matches' uh, approach to lifestyle nutrition training. And at that point, two thousand and nine, uh, CrossFit was a, a new thing, and we decided to uproot and move back to Perth, Australia, which is my hometown, and set up one of Australia's first CrossFit gyms in Perth. So that was two. 2010 and um and that was Kui CrossFit um we were in Perth's western suburbs uh for six years and loved it that's in fact how I met Lynn it was through she was one of our very first athletes we trained together for years um and met like just had the most amazing time with that with that gym and uh and the community of people that that we built um then we had a, a it was now probably nearly three years, nearly coming up to four years ago. Um, my father got really ill um, and, uh, and all lifestyle related um, and complications from type 2 diabetes. He ended up with uh, having a triple heart bypass and later having his right leg amputated below the knee uh, and was essentially in intensive care for six months. I found that an incredibly stressful time. And, uh, and then uh, I guess probably and maybe a knock-on of that stress was I was then diagnosed six months later with a rare and aggressive skin cancer. And I think there's a couple of things that, uh, that led into that diagnosis, one being the stress. Um, two, I spent a ton of time in my late teens and early 20s on sunbeds. Um, so, you know, the, where the uh, cancer was was on the tip of my ear. And um, so I now have a funny little pixie ear, I call it, that you can't even notice. The surgeon did an amazing job. Uh, but, you know, that I, I think, you know, you have fundamental points in your life where there's a sudden shift, like a really you can't see the world the same ever again once certain things happen. And, and I know for anyone that's ever had a, a cancer diagnosis, like it makes you sit up and go, am I living the life I want to live? Um, what if life is shorter than I thought it was going to be? What am I going to do with it? Mm -hmm. So that kind of led um, my hubby and I to have a lot of very, you know, real conversations. And uh, we did make the very difficult decision to sell our gym, but we went all in and we were like, if we're going to do this, we're going all in. So we sold the house, the furniture in the house, mm -hmm. the cars, um, every worldly possession we had and basically condensed life into a suitcase and a carry on each and moved up to Bali with no idea of what we we're going to do next. And that was, so I'm uh, 48 now, so that's nearly three years ago. So, you know, talk about having a midlife crisis. Um, <laughs> that, that might be it. Uh, but uh, to, um, just, sorry, do you want to jump in? Yeah, yeah. Let, me, let me dive in because I'm sure our... Um, listeners right now are going like, wow, you know, not, not only was dad really sick, but, you know, you had the health scare and then you not only sold your business, but your house, you kind of did everything that you possibly could um, that would normally be really stressful for people. But, you know, you, you did it all at the, the same time and then you moved country uh, and, and also with no real idea of, of what you were going to do and where you were going to 
going to go. So just love to dig into a few of those things if I could. Mm -hmm. yeah. The first one is, is around dad. Because um, you, you mentioned that dad had type 2 diabetes. And ha had he had that for a long time? Do you think it was diet related? You know, what, what's your thoughts on, on his condition? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He, he did have it for at least a good decade, and, but he was in denial. And he'll, he'll fess that up now too. Um, and I think had a, a lot of improper advice from doctors and didn't, you know, it wasn't sort of directed down the correct route so um and being any you know an incredibly stubborn male and um and he's very uh, a type um very successful ceo and very high stress industry that he's always worked in so i think he you know like his health was always put on the back burner mm -hmm. and um, and I do remember the morning that his leg was amputated, you know, he called me to tell me it was happening. So I rushed into the hospital and I sat with him just going, how are you about this, Dad? You know, and he, he just looked at me straight in the eye and he just said, I've got no one else to blame but myself for the mismanagement of my own health for all these years. And I was just like, you know, like I still get goosebumps thinking about, about that. Um, and... Gosh, he's such an incredibly resilient person and strong-willed and, and, and uh, a bit stubborn. Um, but, uh, you know, he's in great health now um, and, uh, and has completely changed his lifestyle around. I'm just, uh, and I guess maybe this is where my passion comes now, is that I'm just sad and that he had to go through all of that to get to this point now. And that if there is anything I can do to help others to not have to go through that journey. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for everyone, it's for the person who's going through it, it's hard, but for the family and, and loved ones around, it's equally difficult. So, um, you know, and his life is, is definitely changed now. He's not traveling like he used to. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, we, <laughs> we see a lot of executives that we work a lot in the executive space. And I think what you just said there is really poignant that many of them put career first. They are, climbing the corporate mm -hmm. ladder, they have stressful lives, they're traveling, they're busy. You know, whether they're an executive C-suite, whether they're a manager, whether they're a supervisor, those career-driven people mm -hmm. tend to put wellness last. You know, they don't treat mm -hmm. it as, you know, with the same priority or importance as they do everything else. And then all of a sudden there's a major health crisis comes up, you know, and takes them almost completely unawares but they've always kind of known there was something wrong or, you know, things weren't quite, mm -hmm. quite fitting, um, but it takes something really significant. And I think it's a, it's a real shame when people have to go through that as your dad did, you know, to then realize I've, I've got it wrong and I should have done something about this, but now it's too late because I've, you know, as with your dad, I've lost a leg or something significant has happened. So is, is your mm. dad now, does he eat uh, keto? What, what does he do? What has he done to, to help himself? Uh, well, the biggest thing he's done is stop drinking. So, and he was, you know, not <laughs> just a <laughs> consistent drinker, I would say. Um, typical, you know, 80s businessman who <laughs> grew up in that era. And um, so that's obviously made a huge shift, but he's also vegetarian now. So he has now, his um, kidneys have been very compromised along over the years as well. So he, in fact, and we could do a whole other podcast about this, but last year he went and had stem cell treatment in um, Bangkok and that has reversed his um, type 2 diabetes. He's no longer insulin dependent so combined with the stem cell treatment and the the big changes in his nutrition and diet uh he is like benjamin button now i think his <laughs> wrinkles are even disappearing every time i see him so um you know so it's a great story and i've still got my dad here god bless you know but um yeah it's uh it, yeah i guess that's the you know my kind of health message when i meet people now is like it, we're so focused on career and providing uh particularly in our 40s mm. and and 50s and that's really when the body starts not being able to cope with those stresses like you did in your 30s so yeah. 20s 30s yeah. absolutely yeah. right i mean it's i think it's an amazing message you know to people that you know look look at that that one guy has now you know with a combination of some incredible technology like stem cells mm. 
but also through diets and not just looking for the magic pill. He's obviously put in the hard work himself and turned it around and reversed the type two diabetes. So I think it's a really important message for everybody that it's absolutely possible to reverse some of these, you know, metabolic. One hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. As you did with your dad, yeah, that the the typical resilient, stubborn, pig-headed, successful business person is quintessentially your dad. And there's so many people that who know they should change, but they're so busy, as you said, wrapped up in their career, being successful. They just have the blockers up to doing anything for their health, and often till it's too late. So, yeah, fortunately, your dad was at a stage where things could be fixed and reversed. But many people get to the retirement age and they just can't enjoy retirement because they're mm-hmm. putting Yeah, exactly mm-hmm. right. So that, that was dad's story. And then... <laughs> I know. Turned out being a podcast about dad. You'll love it. <laughs> <laughs> Bring dad on. <laughs> but then, as you said, you, you also had a major health scare. So just um, tell us a bit more, Kirsten, about the skin cancer that you had, the, you know, the diagnosis, the treatment, and you know, where yep. you came from there. Yeah, so so what it was is uh, is called a desmoplastic melanoma. Um, now the great thing about it is that particular melanoma usually only men over sixty five get. So I was a bit of an odd case that almost you know every doctor in Perth wanted to know about. Um, so you know, and I really do truly believe it's down to that time I spent on sun beds. Uh, and it was right on the tip of my ear. So normally that's where you get a lot of sun exposure. Um, and obviously lying down on a sunbed, that's where I'm getting that direct exposure. So uh, it was, and it felt originally, uh, and this is everyone I know (laughs) know who's going to get their skin checked regularly now, it felt almost like a mosquito bite on my ear to start with that was slightly itchy. And I was like, that's a really weird place to be bitten by a mosquito. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, you know, after a week, it was still there. I was like, that's a bit weird. I'm a fair-skinned, freckly person anyway, so I get my skin checked regularly. Next time I went to the doctor, I said, can you just check this thing out? It's been there for a little while now and it's a bit weird. She's like, yeah, I'll, I'll just do a little biopsy. Now, you know it's not good news when the doctor rings you personally the next day. <laughs> and, and, um, and she's like, I booked you in for an appointment with the plastic surgeon. I'm like, huh? Tomorrow. And, you know, so things rapidly, you know, suddenly going, hang on. Um, and so I don't think I realised the gravity of the situation until I actually met with my surgeon, um, who then he proceeded, thankfully my husband was with me, but he proceeded to draw on my ear. And, uh, and they said, I, I come and look in the mirror. Now that's how much we need to cut out. And I, and I swear to God, it was half my ear and I actually nearly fainted. So, you know, Matt, could see the colour leave me and thinking, I was thinking, oh, they'll just take that little bit out. Yeah. Uh, so I realised then that was more serious than what I'd given it mm. thought to. And, uh, and then the next week went in for surgery. Uh, the surgery was great and and I was very fortunate like all my PET scans and everything beforehand had shown that the cancer hadn't gone anywhere else they took out four of my lymph nodes as well at the same time um, and they were all clear so it was very localized um, but they did take a big perimeter to make sure they got it all and uh, amazing plastic surgeon who who basically kind of semi-rebuilt my ear then he, because it was such a rare case, took it to the Waymass Association, which West Australian Melanoma Association, um, to present the case to his colleagues. And a number of them said that in this circumstance, we recommend that she has radiation treatment as well to ensure that the cancer doesn't reappear or metastasize anywhere else. So I went down that route and to the point that I was measured up through a mask and saw the machines and, you know, met with the doctors, um, oncologists and, and uh, nurses. And, and then after that sat with, they said, now, we'll, we'll, you know, you'll meet with your care nurse um, so you've got any questions. And I, the first thing I said to her is I, I said, okay, so what can I do nutrition or exercise or health wise to ensure that my body's as strong as possible while I go through this radiation. Mm. And she just went, nothing. You don't need to do anything. Just carry on doing what you're doing. And I was like, hang on a minute. And you know, this is, I've seen the sickest of people going through their treatment in the waiting room. I'm like, 
that just doesn't sit right with me and my whole background. I was like, there's got to be more to it. So I went away being feeling very, um, you know, when you have a gut feeling and, and I went away just going, I don't think this is right and called my oncologist and said, I want to do some more research. Can you give me the links to all of the research you've got? Um, and he was able to give me the names and details. I have a dear friend who was able to pull that research for me. And everything I read didn't support any any good news about why I would go down that radiation route. So I ended up then just going to Dr. Google, <laughs> as we do, as like, how do, you know, preventing cancer or fighting off cancer, starving cancer. And then one of the very first things that popped up was a video by a guy called Dr. Dominic D'Agostino, and it's a TEDx talk called Starving Cancer. So that was literally one of the very first things I saw and heard about the ketogenic diet as a very successful way for assisting, reducing, and even preventing cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, so that kind of led me down the rabbit hole. Uh, and then I, followed, I actually made the decision not to undergo radiation. And I told my doctor, I said, I'm going to do it my way and ended up going into and doing a very strict um, therapeutic ketogenic diet and felt amazing. <laughs> and um, every PET scan has been clear since. So, uh, yeah. Kirsten, a really amazing story, I think. So mm. one of the, the first thing I'm interested in is, the, so the form of cancer that you had was pretty aggressive, right? So there, there was a chance that it could, you know, it, it could have become more invasive or it could have spread. Mm -hmm. um, you made that choice not to have the, you know, the popular radiation therapy or, you know, which is, which is often shown, I think, in many cases not to improve survival rates significantly, but it's done as a, a sort of a, a belt and braces option just in case. Mm. But it, but when you challenged it, what sort of, you know, reactions did you get from friends and family and doctors who, you know, were mm. all pushing you in that direction? And, and you were saying, no, nah, I'm not going to take <clears throat> your advice. I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do something completely different. What, what were the challenges? <laughs> yeah, um, I think it's perhaps not the first time in my life that everyone thought I was crazy. Um, <laughs> so... Yeah, that was a challenge in itself because the the social norm and the medical norm is to follow the advice of your doctors. And, um, the, yeah, definitely, uh, you know, and I, I'm so blessed and I'm so thankful. The three, probably the three most important people in my life, my husband, Matt, and my mum and my dad, and I'm so thankful that they are all very supportive of whatever decision I made they would support me 100%. So, uh, you know, kind of once I knew I had them behind my back, then it didn't, the rest didn't really matter, to be honest. Um, yeah, and I think kind of my doctors were like, all right, we hope we don't see you again. But, yeah, so it's um, so yeah, really, it's really a challenge. Yeah, really brave choice, right, to, you know, let all the, the medical people know, <laughs> I don't believe you're right, I'm right going to do it my way and you know thankfully as you said it worked out which is amazing and we all know now that this is the best approach but certainly even back then you know the ketogenic diet wasn't as popular it hadn't gained you know, that popularity so just again for the for the benefit of the listeners when you say a strict um, therapeutic keto diet mm -hmm. tell us what you mean by that so that's where like 70% of my macronutrients are coming from fats and then only like 15, 20% from protein, um, 5, 10% from carbohydrates. And I was doing very clean as well. So the carbohydrates I was having were just leafy greens, yep. basically. Yep. Yeah. And the sort of fats and not bacon or any like I was also very mindful of um, eliminating any processed food, so eating food as close to its natural source as well. So um, really good quality fats, meats, yeah, and and lots of green vegetables, yeah. 
Yeah, and I think, again, this is where a lot of people go wrong, but, you know, they think, as you mentioned right at the start, they can do di dirty keto or lazy keto, mm -hmm. and so they've got processed foods in there, they've got shit fats in there, you know, they've, they've still got artificial sweeteners, and there's a lot of chemicals in, you know, in their diet, and we really don't know how the body reacts to those chemicals. Mm -hmm. So if you do want to achieve those therapeutic levels because you're fighting mm -hmm you know, a condition or a disease or an illness, then you want to be as clean as possible. And as you just said, right back to the natural state. So the whole mm -hmm. food, the meat from the animal, the fat from the animal, you know, the vegetables, um, you know, yeah. good quality, organic, grass fed, all of those, you know, really important things that I think people don't realize the, the importance of that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people do yeah. want the, they want the benefits of keto. Mm. They want all the, the, the great benefits, mm. the wellness benefits and all the, all the good things that go with it, but they're not prepared to follow it as strictly as you should. And they're trying to cheat and trying to find ways to tick mm. the macros box, mm. but still get the benefits. And it just doesn't work that way. So I'm going to jump <clears> forward <throat> a bit. So, you, you know, you <clears throat> think, you know, amazing got through your health crisis and I would say came out the other side even better than you were before from, you know, from what I know of you, Kirsten, and from what you said. And then, you know, you guys up sticks and you moved country, you sold your bricks and mortar business, changed your lives. So before we talk about what you're doing in Bali, how is it being keto in Bali? Is that, is that easy? Is it challenging? You know, what's life like today? Yeah, I actually find it very easy here. And, um, uh, and it's, it, it's interesting, I'll just caveat this now, just saying I don't follow a strict keto diet any longer. Um, so it's funny, a friend asked me if, if I am, and I was like, well, you know what? I'm actually probably a clean eating, low carb, meat eating vegetarian now. Yeah, it's like, you know, like, how do you put a label on all of it? It's like, so it, as an umbrella, like, it, you know, that's keto, it's low, low carb, it's um, paleo, it's primal, like all of that, uh, that umbrella. And the way I look at my nutrition now is like nutrition and exercise now um, for longevity. Like I still want to be feeling this great in another 50 years. Um, so it's, it, I look at it more as that holistic rather than for a specific purpose. Mm -hmm. um, so, but to come back to that question of, is it easy to do in Bali? Yes, like it's, it, there is an abundance of amazing fresh produce, um, you know, definitely living here now, I eat a lot more vegetables and salads um, than I did when we were in Australia. I eat a lot less meat as well. I think Australians, we're so meat heavy and really, you know, all we need is about the size of your palm of your hand as a portion of your protein. So whereas, you know, any regular Aussie steak on a barbecue is about half the plate. And <laughs> so that, that has changed a lot for me in terms of those portion sizes and I eat uh, more seafood here. But, uh, and, and I find it easy. And of course, you know, avocados are in abundance here. Yeah. Um, amazing nuts and seeds, uh, you know, and I love those fattier fishes, your tuna and your salmon, um, that type of thing. So, yeah, I find it, I find it easy. It's just, and, and look, here, I, this is a complete confession. I never, ever cook in Bali. <laughs> and so uh, every meal I either eat out or have delivered in, and I now just know I've got half a dozen that we go to where I know that and it's essentially selecting from the menu and, and tweaking things a little bit. So, yeah. Perfect. And so... The joys of Bali. The joys of Bali. Yeah. That's true. The joys yeah. of, a, of a tropical island where, you know, the, the, if you look in the right places, there's amazing, amazing food. And so mm -hmm. you, you guys have landed in Bali. You've been there, what, three, about three and a half years now? Uh, coming up to three next February, so yeah, so, just so under. And you know, again, you've completely changed your lives, not just diet, not just health, but you have completely changed your life. So what do you do now? How do you manage to mm -hmm. stay in Bali? You know, do you have a bricks and mortar business now? Um, you know, do you, do you want to work back in the corporate world? Because I think most of our listeners by now are picking up the fact that, you, you know, you are very good at understanding what your purpose in life is 
how you can mm-hmm. help other people, mm. um, how you can really achieve what you want to achieve. And it doesn't sound like you'll ever go back to that corporate way of life. Or <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm shaking my head. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, you're quite right. I will not be going back to the corporate life. And uh, while it was good to me, well, those years lasted, I, I couldn't think of anything worse now. Uh, so whilst uh, when we landed here, we, we seriously considered setting up fitness retreats, um, you know, because that was kind of our background that we knew inside and out. We had done a couple of Bali retreats with our gym previously. So we thought that was a natural kind of progression. And we got here and I, and I started, you know, I was trying to make the connections, build the business, build the site, and I just had no passion for it. And so I think that's when we realised that that's not what we wanted to do. You know, you've got infinite energy for something that you're really excited about and want to build. Mm. So that went on on the shelf and then we're like, okay, now what? Uh, And I had at that point heard, obviously through all my keto research, about exogenous ketone supplements. And so that then, you know, Matt and I kind of started looking at that and realising it was a network marketing business model that um, the, the ketones are sold through. So we ended up looking at that and very seriously went, well, A, first of all, let's try them ourselves, which we did. And uh, definitely, and, and I can talk more about that too, but definitely felt that was a huge help in uh in both just supporting our nutrition, but also from a fitness and performance and recovery point of view, and also balancing out of my hormones point of view. So very delighted with, you know, actually what that um, supplement did. And then also looking deeper into the business model of it and realizing that, well, here's a business structure that I can do largely online through, you know, Zoom calls like we're doing now, through phone call, um, when I'm face to face with people, it's even better. And and actually then, you know, working, you know, had some amazing introductions through yourselves, Lynn and Mike, in into Singapore. So, you know, we've actually now built a really successful business all based on that education still, because I'm such a firm believer is yes, supplements have a role to play and it's and and the way I look at it, it's just a biohack, right? I'm always looking for those little biohacks to help make things better. And so I'm still such a firm believer of getting that core of, you know, your nutrition, your recovery, your sleep, your exercise, your stress reduction, all of that component, like that lifestyle bit. Mm. You can't just go and drink ketones and eat beer and drink yeah, drink beer and eat pizza the other way around. <laughs> Be interesting. Um, but, uh, you know, you can't, you can't just pop a Band-Aid over it and think that that's magically going to change your life. Uh, so, that, yeah, so really now we live in Bali thanks to that income that we've now generated through. And I say we because Matt is in the business with me as well. Um, and then he also, it's a whole other story with Matcha's side of things that he's, <laughs> he's uh, partnered with a, a, a sound healing business out of Ubud. So it's gone. The, uh, we do laugh because it's a little bit now. We've worked for so many years in the physical fitness space and the nutritional fitness space. And really his is more the spiritual fitness, we're calling it. So there's yeah. a, a really nice uh, blend of all of it for that overall Holistic lifestyle, I think, yeah. Very cool. So, so Kirsten, now you have this, this global business that's very successful based out of Bali that gives you this opportunity to, to work remotely and travel and have that freedom of lifestyle. Matt has obviously got his own business to the side now. So you guys are, are really full-time back in business and obviously very busy with the, the commitments and the work you're doing. Take us to what Kirsten does because a lot of our listeners are all about wellness and balancing <clears throat> their own wellness with the commitments they have, be them in corporate life or be them in business. Give us, give us a bit of a snapshot of what you currently do to keep yourself grounded, keep yourself balanced. What's your personal wellness routine? Kind of like what my day days yeah, look like. Yeah, the life of yeah. Kids, really cool for the <laughs> listeners to kind of get yeah. a sense of what you do to stay where you are. Yeah, so pretty much 
every day is I wake up at 5.45 a.m. and I'll meditate for 15 to 25, 30 minutes if I'm having a good one. Um, so, and I've, I'm actually doing a, a, a meditation teacher training course at the moment through an amazing organisation called Mind Oasis. So that I've found has been fantastic the daily practice of meditation for just helping to set my day the right way so uh so that's the morning kick off then i'll head into the gym and be there oh and hang on after i've meditated i'll have a shot of apple cider vinegar with a little bit of himalayan salt just down it pull the funny face still do i've been doing it for years but i can't do it without the face yeah and then i'll have a glass of water which is half Warm water, half just room temperature, so it's warm water. Sip on that and then drink uh, about 700 millilitres of um, my ketone supplement. So I kind of, the, you know, basically the way I look at it is I'm a, a litre ahead on the water before I've stepped out, <laughs> of the, out the door. So then I'll go to the gym and generally be at the gym. You know, we, we do have the luxury of time here, so I'm usually at the gym two hours training, talking, <laughs> socialising, <laughs> then, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a networking. And, uh, and then, uh, and I love, love, love going there because, you know, surrounded too by people who are half my age, let's face it, that motivate me, inspire me, keep me feeling younger, you know, that it's, it's a great, great community. And that's what I love about CrossFit too, probably more than anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I'll come back and probably jump in the pool, have a little bit of sun time. So this always amazes people as a skin cancer diagnose, a diagnosis that I religiously spend 30 minutes in the sun sunbaking every day. I do 15 minutes each side and I put a timer on it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's kind of my little quiet time um, where I just mentally go through like what I want to do for the day or I'll listen to a podcast or read a book while I do that. Uh, and then during, then I'll eat. The first meal of our day is probably around midday, one o'clock sometimes. So generally every day I would intermittent fast and that's I would have my evening meal before seven, eight o'clock at the latest and then the first meal of the day, not until midday the next day. Mm. I find that works fantastically for me. Um, it helps me keep my calories down but give me beautiful meals when I have them. And it, it's also such a huge benefit as we age. There's a lot of science behind that with how particularly when you exercise in a fasted state, that increases your human growth hormone as well, uh, which is particularly important as we get older. It's the one that produces and is a real driver of all the other hormones. So that, uh, yep, yeah, would go and eat something yummy and fresh and lovely in Bali that someone's made for me and then come back and, and then I, I think I'm so much more productive now. Like I will then sit down and crank out work. That's when I do all my phone calls, my messages, my reconnecting with people, um, my social media, all of that in that hotter, hottest part of the day when you don't really want to be out in Bali anyway. Um, and then get to, to kind of sunset time. I'll either go for a walk on the beach or uh, yin yoga to stretch out, I'll go and catch up with friends for a coconut and sunset, you know, it's, um, and then eat pretty early. So it's a very simplistic life here and, um, yeah, it's a lovely little routine. So that, that's when I'm here. When I'm travelling, it goes all over the place. <laughs> Sounds perfect, Kirsten. I do want to pick up on the point you mentioned around the sun. And mm. it is very controversial, you know, whether you should sunbake, whether you shouldn't, at what time of day, you know, should you sunbake in the morning, afternoon, should you sunbake at lunchtime? And for many of the Australians who are listening in, you know, the advice that everybody's given here, mm. you know, especially by the skin cancer specialists, will be put on your sun cream before you leave the house, don't get the incidental sun, don't sit out in the sun, it's too intense. So, you know, you, there you are, you're sitting in front of us looking amazingly healthy. You have, you know, you're looking really well, your skin looks in good condition, but you've had skin cancer and yet you still go out and, and sunbake. So tell us your philosophy on, you know, the sun and the sun exposure. 
Yeah, and, and there's, uh, you know, I didn't do this lightly either, <laughs> but I have all my life been a sun worshipper and grew up in surf club in, in Australia and have always loved the feeling of the ocean and sun and, and that feeling that you get when you've got a bit of a tan. Mm. Now, what I know now is that there's actual science behind that, like having that vitamin D, which is, you know, we're absorbing into our bodies through the, the sun exposure, actually does wonders for your mental health as well as, you know, at a cellular level. So, and it is important, like I, I don't, you know, when I've been traveling and say, like I know next winter we're gonna be spending three months in uh, Whistler skiing. So I won't have any sun exposure during that time. And when we come back, I'll start literally with two minutes each side and then slowly build it up. So don't just suddenly go and jump out in the sun and burn. Like, and that I never ever burn. And I, unless I know I'm gonna be in the water all day, I never wear sunscreen either. So I just don't, think that the chemicals in those products that we're putting on our bodies are that great. If I do, if I'm in the water, I'll just literally plaster my face with zinc mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and wear a long sleeve rashy and basically cover up. So if I know I'm going to be in the sun for extended periods, I, I just cover up with clothing. Um, but yeah, and that's that healthy, small little daily doses. I'd much rather get my vitamin D that way than in a tablet. Absolutely right. I mean, what, what we know is that that's how the body's meant to produce vitamin D. Um, you mm. know, the, the fact that we've got uh, melatonin in our skin that allows us to produce the vitamin D um, means that we should be using that rather than trying to take a tablet, which is the wrong form, which the body probably can't absorb anyway. And it's full of fillers and other mm -hmm. chemicals as well. Mm. But again, we don't really know the damage that they're doing to the body. So yeah, we're, we're of this, <coughs> the same belief, you know, that, uh, that 30 Some minutes things. of, of sun every day. And I think something that you, you mentioned that's really important is don't burn. You know, it's really mm. good to get the sun, get the vitamin D, get the mood boosting benefits, but don't stay out so long that you burn. Just do those little short bursts and you, you'll be amazed what the, uh, what the benefits are. Mm. Yeah. So, very cool. Yeah, just a question around your um, your wellness routine in the evening, Kirsten. So you've had your evening mm -hmm. wellness quite early, and then leading into the evening, is there any specific routine you have that leads you into the sleep time that sets you up for a really good sleep at night? Have, walk us through what you do in the evening. Yeah, so interestingly, I actually do a lot of my business in the evening. So I do a lot of phone calls and Zoom calls because that's when I'm connecting with other people in my team and other customers that they've finished their work day. Uh, so I do do a lot of work in the evening. And then uh, what I do to wind down is what's really important. So a couple of things, I always sleep in a very pitch black room yeah. and, and cool room. So I know we're those people in Bali that run their aircon just at night and sleep under a doona, <laughs> but having that, <laughs> that cool room. And, and then I'll just do some mindful, you know, a little bit of meditation just to wind my mind down uh, or I'll read and, um, and just, and complete nothing that, you know, it's like that's when I'll read my trashy novels to basically <laughs> just wind, wind the brain down and, um, and before going to bed and and also like definitely eating earlier and not having you know sugary food or chocolate or any stimulant uh in that evening makes a big difference so and how, how much, i've always been a pretty good sleeper though i'm pretty lucky yeah. and that, that was my next question was how much sleep do you sh do you shoot for kirsten <clears throat> uh generally about seven hours yep good yeah, yeah. that's and I think, you know, there's a, there's a lot on sleep around at the moment. So we've got a series running about sleep and sleep hacks mm. because if you look at the statistics a hundred years ago, people typically slept an hour longer than they do today. So we know that, you know, in just a hundred years, the quantity of sleep, let alone the quality of sleep has been eroded. So again, it's, it's a message that we are super keen on mm. Spreading that, you know, good sleep is one of those important pillars of wellness, as you said earlier. You mm -hmm. can't just take a magic pill. You need to eat well. You need to move your body. You need to sleep. You put it all together and you can end up with outstanding, you know, health and wellness. Mm. And a lot of people in that sort of 45 plus age group were sort of brought up on the badge of honour for being able to survive mm. without sleep. And it's, it's taking a while for people to change the mindset 
it's great to sleep. Your, mm. your, your career, your motivation, your energy, your health will benefit if you get great sleep. Mm. You don't need to survive on four or five hours sleep at night. Exactly yeah. right. And yeah. so we've got one last question for you. And that's mm -hmm. really just to hear your top three tips. And I'm, I'm going to limit you to three. And I, I know that's oh, that's oh, top oh. <laughs> <laughs> But if somebody's coming in and they're coming into this, you know, the keto lifestyle, um, you know, generally trying to improve their wellness, what would be Kirsten's top three tips for success? All right, I'm, I'm thankful that you preempted me last night with the top three because I have like a list as long as my arm. Um, so number one is just focus on the 1% betters. So, you know, I'm the kind of person that you can hear by my choices and the rip the Band-Aid off approach. It doesn't work for 99% of people, right? So it's the, the little small 1% betters. And it's even if you're eating out and you're like, oh, my God, there isn't keto choices on the menu. It's like, that's okay. Just what's the better choice that you can make, you know? So it, it's... Go easy on yourself and just think every day 1%, 1% better. And that in a year's time is going to be a dramatic change. Mm -hmm. So that's tip number one. Um, second one, and I have to say this with absolute hand on heart belief, is supplement with exogenous ketones. Mm. It makes the journey so much easier at the beginning. Yeah. And I really wished I'd known about it when we had the gym because we used to run a lot of nutrition programs and I would see people get to that day five, day seven, and they, can't, they would crawl into the gym and say, I'm going <laughs> to die, you're killing me. <laughs> and, and be like, I'm getting the flu, I've got a headache, I've got withdrawals of craving. And, and it was literally their metabolic system was about to shift into mm. that state of ketosis or that fat-burning mode. But their brain was struggling with that, right? Mm. So by having the ketone supplements makes a big difference because you're already delivering those ketone molecules into your body. So it definitely makes the journey easier. Um, and then the third thing, funnily enough, we're just talking about the sleep, is I would make uh, reducing stress and sleep a priority. So there's so many people I've worked with over the years that just you know, they'll follow the nutrition, they'll do the exercise, they do everything right and they just can't budge the weight. Mm. And then when I get the opportunity to sit down with them and really talk and, and look further into their life, it's the amount of stress they've got on them. You know, I had a, a friend who her mother was going through her last months in life. So, you know, that's stressful. Just the, the different things that... Are, that stress play because when you're in that stress state, your body's in that fight or flight mode and you've got high levels of cortisol ro racing around your bloodstream, which is then going to prevent you from being able to even tap into your fat stores to start using that as an energy source. Mm -hmm. So if you can, and, and sleep is a big factor in just, you know, resting, recovering, and maybe it's you need to knock back the exercise because if you're already having a super stressful time at work or at home and then you come and try to perform at that same level in the, in the gym, then you're just adding and piling more stress onto it. So that might be where you need to look at some, you know, lovely sunset beaches on the walk in, you know, <laughs> and walk, walk along the, the, the beach for sunset instead. But, uh, yeah, so they're my three. Awesome. Look, that's, that's hard to condense to three. <laughs> no, they're, <laughs> good ones, they're fantastic. Look, love those, Kirsten. I think, you know, you're right. A lot of people do dive in and, you know, try to do everything at once mm. um, and they don't get the results that, you know, that they deserve. So that just doing a little bit every day. And I love your analogy of, you know, once you've got to the end of the year, each of your 1%, when you add it up, is actually an enormous change, but you've done it sustainably. You've done it in a way that's formed mm -hmm. great habits and you've changed your life. You've just, you've taken a year to do it, but let's face it, if you're going to live another 50 years, mm -hmm. then taking one year to make that sort of change is actually not a lot of time and it's setting you, you up for longevity. So love that hack, mm -hmm. love all the hacks. I think they're, they're great tips for anybody who's just starting out. So Kirsten, I'm sure we could all talk for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. You've got this 
wealth of knowledge and you know we'd, we'd love to have you back again sometime to, to dig even deeper into some of these topics um, but for now I think you know we want to say from from Mike and myself mm, um, from our listeners and our watchers um, all around the world thank you so much for taking some time to share with us we loved hearing about your story I think you know you've got so many amazing successes in there that it's truly inspirational um, for everybody who's tuned in. So thanks for joining us on the, the Peaks Life and we can't wait to have you back. Absolutely. <laughs> thanks guys. Thank you so much.